to our program on this Saturday morning. I'm your guest host, Patty Pyburn, in for our Randall White. He is on vacation this morning in Madison, Wisconsin. Joining us on the phone, we have John Allen. He's from USC, neuroanthropologist, also the author of The Omnivorous Mind, and it's all about food and why we eat what we eat. I can't wait to hear more about this. Good morning, John. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so in this past week, I I haven't read the entire book, but I have um, been paging through it and hitting some of the highlights. It's really fascinating, and I intend to read the entire thing because it really piqued my interest as I started to um, read about it. So you are looking at food in a different way, in sort of a historical and scientific way. Yeah, I mean, my ulti- the initial goal was to talk about how we, how we think food, that, that we eat with our minds as much as our mouths and our stomachs, and, you know, look at that over our old evolutionary past, and certainly there are certain times in our past when people think our, our changing diet was, was critically important, and then to bring it up into more contemporary times in a in, in looking how culture influences the mind and how cognitive uh, aspects of, of uh, or basically thinking, influences how you eat. So one of the, the things that I read in your book is that there were some key developments, evolutionarily speaking, for humans. Um, and fishing, we think, maybe is one of those moments where that gave us a big advantage and, and really literally fed our brains? Well, it's, it's, there are two views on that. One is, is that actual marine foods provided certain fatty acids that may have been critical. But I think even more, not so much the specific thing, but when our ancestors first started to use, who are, are somewhat ape-like and then changing slowly over a few million years, uh, that sign of using marine resources is, or is a sign of, of this expanding omnivory. And I call us the super omnivores because we eat, as a species, we eat just about anything. But then even beyond just being omnivores, we also don't eat just about anything. And what we do and don't eat is, is governed both by our biology and our culture. Right. So, and I have to admit, I'm one of those people that there's definitely a high ooh factor for certain foods. And and we'll get right into the crispy one because I think that's pretty intriguing. And I want to tell you, just a few weeks back, I was in Pismo Beach here on the Central Coast Mm -hmm. and I was working on a story and I came across um, some kids ranging the age of five, seven, eight years old, and they had stopped at a candy shop. And but what they were ordering to eat were dried insects, and they thought it was just the coolest, fun. You know, they just thought, "Oh, look at us! We're eating insects." And it was, it was cute, but it was also gross. Yes. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. For for yes, for our, our backgrounds, yes. So explain the connection between our desire for crispy, crunchy, and maybe insects. Well, if you go way back in our evolutionary history, which is, is we're, let's say, the origins of primates, which is maybe about 60 million years ago, um, we have a lot, of, even today, there are little prosimian sort of primates. They're those kind of odd-looking ones like tarsiers and some lemurs, um, the lemurs. They all, a lot of those eat a lot of insects. And going back in time, the thing that may have helped us differentiates us from other kinds of mammals was to have a, 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 an insect-eating, uh, a predation sort of habit based on bugs. And so if we go back that far, you know, bugs are crispy and so on. And that, that's pretty distantly far. But if we go to more closer relatives of ours, you know, they'll, they'll eat bugs. It isn't their favorite food, but they certainly will eat them, and mm-hmm. chimps will eat termites and, and so on. And then if we look at most, you know, look at human cultures across the globe, uh, we see quite a bit of insect eating. It's just not something that a, a mammal with a body our size, unless you, you tap into uh, whole termite mounds or, or like ant colonies like an ant, we can't really survive just on insects. But we have that in our, our background, potentially. Right. So there really isn't an insect supply that we could become insect eaters. But culturally speaking, obviously, there are still places where... Um, you know, chocolate-covered grasshoppers are considered a special treat. It is. It is. I mean, it, it would always, and the thing I kind of relate this to more in, in more uh, recent evolutionary past is that it's obvious that we have these appeals for 
uh, based on sense, our sensory appeals of sugar and, and uh, sweet and uh, salty and, and, you know, umami, sort of savory stuff, and, and maybe even fatty, are, are basic. But we don't have the peel. Crispy is not necessarily a, a, a taste. And so one thing I, I look at is that if we have these preferred foods, if they're sort of fruits and so on, um, we also ha- primates have, they call them fallback foods, are the foods you eat when the best foods aren't available. And a lot of those fallback foods, such as insects or just vegetable matter, uh, stalks or leaves, mm-hmm. are actually sort of crispy and crunchy. So to have some appeal uh, beyond the basic sort of sensory ones, maybe crispy and crunchy provides that as well. Because that's sort of the process of eating, the sound of eating, the texture in your mouth. All of yeah. those kinds of things are being triggered beyond just taste and nutrition, right? Right, and the sound is an interesting one, I think, as we get looking at what people are like, what we do today. I, I was thinking as I was eating a bowl of popcorn watching a basketball game or something a couple weeks ago, and I, I realized all I was doing was enjoying the crunch of it, that, right. I, that I sort of habituated to the the flavor of the popcorn and the saltiness even of it, but the crunch kept me kind of engaged with it. It's how we can power through a whole bag of potato chips and then go, oh, what did I just do? Right, because you're, you're, it's actually a, a, more, a more loaded sensory experience. Like a tactile kind of thing. Yeah, so it, it, it's got all that going. And it's interesting about the kids, if you really want to, like, and, and like the whole book is sort of dealing with these eating things at different levels. If we could get up to the, uh, an even more sort of psychological level, contemporary level, is a lot of these crunchy and crispy foods now are, are, uh, are sort of considered to be bad for you because a lot of them have fat, right. high fat content or salt. But to even eat them, you can get a sort of uh, enjoyment out of the fact that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. And like those kids on the beach, part of the thrill of eating those bugs was to be eating something that that wasn't, you know, quote, normal. Right. Yes. They were, it was like this, the kind of shock factor. They're like, look at me. I, right. I'm eating grasshoppers and worms. And right. yeah, they so thought was that providing was providing this sort of secondary <laughs> uh, advantage. But they were all dried, like you said. So they were crispy and crunchy. So that it kind of played into that. Now, you mentioned salty a couple of times. And that's something that we know from a health standpoint really can, can be bad for us. But we, I included, a lot of people have sort of a craving for salt, especially at certain times. Oh, sure. I mean, we need sodium, um, you know, for basic function. And there's a lot of studies, there's a, it, uh, and they've some have come out quite recently. The whole, you know, there are some people who definitely salt's really quite bad for them in higher levels, and some people probably less so, but we get a sort of blanket indictment of, of salt. But, yes, it certainly is one of those things that people can can have a, a crave at, at a sort of physiological level. So we only have two minutes left. I'm watching the clock ticking, um, John, and I'm really thinking, gosh, I wish I had more time because I honestly have so many questions. Yeah. But do you have any information for pregnant women who get really strong cravings? I had some weird ones. I wanted super spicy foods, and I went, went through one pregnancy where salt, I could not get enough salt. Is, mm. is Does this have a, a tie-in? Um. You know, pregnancy cravings are a very, I, I didn't really discuss it, they're, they're a fairly complex thing. I'd say, to some extent, if, if to, you know, in moderation, that they're probably, they're okay to indulge. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't be, um, but why we would have specific ones, uh, I don't know offhand. Oh, well, interesting. And of course, I, I have to say, you always have to check with your doctor if you're, mm-hmm. you know, going crazy on salt or something. Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but those pregnancy cravings can really be overpowering. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as I said, I do have more questions for you. And if you have a moment to stay on the line with us, we'd like you to hold on for just a moment. We're going to have to do some uh, commercial breaks and, you know, sure. sort of the business of the show. But if you have some time, we're going to keep you on the line. What do you think? Okay. Oh, hang on. Okay, well, that's awesome. Um, John Allen with USC, a neuroanthropologist, has this great book out called The Omnivorous Mind. He's filling us in on some of the the reasons why we eat what we do, why we crave what we crave. And uh, coming up in just a few moments, we'll also be speaking with the winemaker from Letitia Vineyards in San Luis Obispo County. He's going to be talking about green winemaking practices. Also, big upcoming event, Roll Out the Barrels, happening in downtown San Luis Obispo. He'll be talking more about that and you are listening to eat drink explore radio network live from downtown san luis obispo on this beautiful saturday morning i'm patty piver and filling in this morning for randall white and we're back in just a few moments 
Welcome back to the Eat, Drink, Explore radio network. Here now is your fabulous host, Mr. Randall White. I think she meant your fabulous guest host, Miss Patty Piper, and I'm filling in for Randall White. He is fabulous, and he just uh, sent me a little message that he's out the door in Madison, Wisconsin. He's getting on a bicycle and heading over to the farmer's market. He's enjoying a vacation, and I'm here on this Saturday morning with you all enjoying downtown San Luis Obispo, talking about food, wine, craft beer, travel, tourism, health, you name it, all things Eat, Drink, Explore related. That's what we're talking about. Um... I have in my hands, for those of you who are watching, some people are watching online, this great book, The Omnivorous Mind. It is by John Allen. He is with USC. He's a neuroanthropologist. I have been reading through this book. It's simply fascinating. We kept John Allen on the line so we can ask him more questions related to why we choose to eat what we eat, why we crave certain things, and why we might have an aversion to certain foods. So joining us again, good morning, John. Thanks morning. for staying with us. Thanks. So one of the things I was reading in your book is, you know, I love Indian food. I love spicy food. I will sit through a meal with my mouth on fire and sweat <laughs> pouring mm-hmm. down, but I can't stop. Can you explain that phenomenon? <laughs> Not wanting to stop eating spicy food? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the spicy uh, food <clears throat> thinking is, is based on endogenous uh, opioids and, and various brain chemicals that you're, as the pain... You have all sorts of, of mechanisms in your brain to, to quell the, uh, the pain that you might be experiencing. So if you know that it's, it's really not going to be anything other than a, a temporary pain, then you start to enjoy that feeling. It's like people equate it to a runner's high. So you just fight through the pain so that you can enjoy something like your favorite spicy Indian food right. or what have you, and salsa. it's important you know, that you're, you're kind of getting an, a sort of an override there you're not at a base level you're not because you're getting this response but you're overriding it because you know it really isn't causing you any damage got it it's causing you little short-term damage but it's not causing you long like most real pain would be you'd have to worry about that right not like a broken limb or something you're, yeah it's food <laughs> or like the first i always i as i write in there I, I think you know some somebody some you know Native American in South America ate the first pepper and, and didn't just say, oh, I'm never going to eat this stuff again, but decided that it was worth something to eat and to cultivate. And, you know, billions of people around the world have whoever that was to thank, but that was a, an interesting thing that person did. Okay, so now there are some foods that we have an aversion to that were, oh, you know, I have a friend who really <clears throat> will do anything to avoid broccoli. In fact, she can't even have it touch her other food. Right. And then there's food that we think of as, quote, unquote, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see them, mm-hmm. um, bad food, but yet we secretly really want to have that donut or have that box yeah. of milk duds. So what's that all about? Well, you know, it's interesting. I looked, I read a lot of, reviewed a lot of literature on genetics and taste, and there's definitely, there's a classic anthropology lab class uh, with a certain chemical that, there's, a, there's really a genetic predisposition or genetic tendency that you cannot taste it at certain levels and other people can, and you can kind of show do little genetic studies that way. And that does relate to the sort of broccoli-type family of, okay. of foods. But, but, they, but other than that, when they actually try to look to see if these match up to what uh, people eat in, in developed countries and in, in our contemporary environment, uh, the, the correlations are pretty low, actually. So that's sort of interesting. There's not a lot of genetic variation is, is playing some role, but probably not a, a significant role. So what people, one thing that I think that we have, and we're fortunate in this case, uh, to have this steady food supply of a reasonable varied diet, is that we do have the luxury of saying, I'm not eating that, right? Because you know there's food coming somewhere else. Right. It's so not the only sense, thing. It's not the only choice you have. Exactly. I mean, you've got a whole supermarket, you know, uh, full of stuff. If, like I say, if we're, elect, we're really fortunate to be in that position. But the flip side of that, of course, is eating too much, right? And eating too much of the stuff that, that is, I say, really pushes the, 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 the strong buttons, the sweet and the fat. No, I didn't get to read a lot in your book on that topic, but you do address why we overeat you do you do talk about why people tend to eat more than they really should or need to well i think you know for much of our evolutionary history um you ate what was there and there was a lot of pressure uh to whether this goes back through various primates. i mean 
that if you if you had a food source, then you had to eat it. And it, otherwise, you might not have it tomorrow, or you might not have time to eat it then. There might be a predator that would come and knock you away, or somebody else, others of your own species. But it's not like get, you could put it in the refrigerator in your cave. Exactly. And this gets us, we get to be more people-like, and we're, we're perhaps better at, say, hunting larger animals. Then you get this dilemma of, I got this big, dead mastodon, or whatever it is you're hunting, but I can't eat it all. So then it becomes a social thing. And there's, I think... You know, a lot of archaeologists and anthropologists have looked at feasting as being a sort of universal thing that all cultures have sort of feast times, and they're highly social, and they're pleasant, often very pleasant and special. So eating more, you, there, there's a real lots of different reasons for why at any given eating time there might have, we might want to eat more. Because there's a lot of different rewards then that are tying in. It's not just a nutrition activity. You're not just, I'm doing this because I have to stay alive. But <clears throat> there are other pleasure things exactly. involved. Yes, and that's, a, that's eating <laughs> top to bottom, like any sort of complex thing that people do. You know, the really basic ones. Eating is one of the most basic ones, and it, 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 it has all sorts of different inputs. So in your book, you address, well, you call it the omnivorous mind, and you talk about how we eat with our brain, and it's not just all about your stomach and your stomach's grumbling and, it, and you need to fill it. And, and, you know, people say half of your meal is a presentation, we eat with our eyes. So there's a lot of things that go into why we choose food. So address that whole visual aspect of it. Well, we're, 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 as we're growing up, part of that, that visual... Um, or really the presentation of food is, is all cre- created by your cultural environment. But as I say, I think our, our minds are, are sort of pre-adapted to, to not sort of d- uh, take all those clues in piecemeal, so to speak, but to, to construct a way that we eat. And so in a way, I think how we learn to eat um, and where we arrive, say, as, as a young adult, is like learning a language. And you don't sit there and learn your language uh, because someone is explicitly teaching you, at least your first language. Um, you, you acquire it in a certain environment. So when we get down the line about what it is to eat in human cultures, what it is to eat is not just what you stick in your mouth, but how does it look and who's giving it to me and where we're going to eat it. Um, you know, even, even in times when foods are, are scarce in cultures, there's often, uh, you know, a very prescribed way, a correct way, of eating and things that you still would not eat even if you were starving to death. And so all this, the visual appeal, the, the palatability, the social context, all that goes into this sort of mix-up thing that becomes what we would, we, what you might think is, oh, that's my normal way of eating. It's, you don't call it a diet. If you want to switch it, it's like switching to a second language. You call that a diet. That's, and that's something that's, I think, fairly deeply ingrained in your mind as you develop. So it's really a lifestyle, and um, eating is tied to so many different things. And when people say emotional eating, they, it really is emotional eating, right? It can be emotional. It could be, it could be cerebral. But it's, it's gonna, by the time you're an adult, you've developed these habits that are, are, fairly, uh, you know, that are fairly deep. Pretty and that's ingrained. why I think, you know, it, if I say, you know, I can make an ex- incredibly uh, a mundane observation that dieting is hard, well, it's hard in part, not just because things you don't like what you're changing you taste, but you know you spent your whole life developing what I call a theory of food that to change it is really a tough thing. Now it is changeable. I can learn. Uh, you know, people learn second languages. Some people become totally fluent in a second language, and people can change their diet. But I think you have to appreciate just how ingrained it is at a at a at, at the level at a mental level. Very, very difficult. Now, John, we have in studio with us this morning, Curtis Cole. He's a a student who is working with our show for the summer, and he's a foodie. And that's kind of why he got this internship, because he's such a true foodie. He has a question for you, Curtis. Hey, John. Um, So looking at the social hierarchy of foods, you know, there's dishes that people would eat that would kind of establish status, stuff like that. Where do you feel the crispy, crunchy snack foods kind of where they would where would they be placed in that kind of hierarchy? Well, it's interesting. I think that changes uh, over time um, because, you know, as, as, as you might have, you know, if we, if we, another origin, if we go back deep time, might have been part of the uh, appeal of crispy, crunchy evolutionarily is that when we started cooking things, that's a good source of crispy, crunchy, especially on, on meats. 
And you might say, well, that would have been a, a, a more, high, in terms of a simple hierarchy, you might have gone to the higher status. People would have gotten the best bits. Mm -hmm. But then what we have here, of course, in contemporary society is, is a sort of uh, inversion of, of what a lot of dietary hierarchies would have been, which was, is, you know, uh, uh, you know, more availability of, of cheap calories uh, that's more widespread and that there's, there are more, so calories are easily available to everyone relatively inexpensively, but then certain foods are, are not. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of a weird, you know, we, in America especially, we, we took the, the quality of food um, and, and made everybody sort of the same historically and, and didn't emphasize, you know, elite foods. In France, they took the egalité and they, they made food into a more merit to, a meritocracy. That is, you know, everyone could appreciate food, but you would be celebrated uh, for your, your palate or your culinary ability. That is so. really interesting. Um, that's an aspect I hadn't really considered. This, uh, John, I have to say, fascinating book, The Omnivorous Mind. We're talking with John Allen. He is from USC. He's a neuroanthropologist. And if you haven't picked up The Omnivorous Mind, I suggest you pick up your own copy because you're not getting mine. John, a lot of times we give books away, mm -hmm. and I'm not giving this away. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're fighting over it. John, thank you so much for joining us this well, morning. Thanks for having me. And, uh, yes, we have pr the producers here, Curtis, everyone saying, no, I want the copy. No, I want the copy. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Coming up on Eat, Drink, Explore Radio, we are talking to Eric Hickey with Letitia Vineyards. That's straight ahead.